Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, the next tutorial is uh, given by uh, Hans Jörg Scherer from PTB and, and is on quantum based resistance metrology, topical aspects of metrology, and potential of new standards. Uh, Hans Jörg uh, is uh, head of the electrical quantum metrology in, at PTB in Germany and also head of the working group on current and quantum resistance in the same institution. Uh, he's also a vice chair of the section quantum electronics in the European Metrology Network, uh, quantum uh, technologies. Uh, he currently investigates metrological applications on the quantum hall effect in novel Dirac-Cohn materials, including graphene and topological insulators. And in 2018, he was awarded with, uh, together with uh, three PTP colleagues, the Helmholtz Prize for his work on traceable measurements and generation of a small direct currents. So. Uh, thank you, Hans Jörg, for, for being here. And uh, I will let you now uh, share your screen and start your tutorial. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, for the nice introduction, can you see and hear me? Uh, perfect. Very good. Then I will try to share my screen with the correct window. And Go to the presentation mode now. How does this work? Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you. Um, let me just shift this. Okay. Yeah, thank you again for the nice introduction, Sergio, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Hans Jörg Scherer. As uh, Sergio said, I'm from the um, Physical Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, which is, which is Germany's. Uh, National Metrology Institute. And as you can see from the title of my talk, this talk will be less focused on lots of topological aspects, but more on the aspects um, of those systems that are very interesting for us um, doing electrical quantum metrology. So I will uh, talk about the topical aspects of metrology and potential of new standards based on topological uh, systems um, in, in particular on those systems that uh, show the quantum anomalous Hall effect. This is the outline of my talk. Um, as uh, I should probably do as a speaker from metrology, uh, I should first uh, introduce um, uh, some standards or some, some general things about uh, what metrology is and how it evolved in the past years. So it will be about the development and evolution of the um, international unit system. Uh, then I will shortly speak about the role of the quantum electrical effects um, in the system, meaning the quantum Hall and the Josephson effects for the primary Ohm or Volt uh, realizations. Then I will turn to quantum resistance metrology based on the quantum Hall effect in particular and talk about state of the art devices and measurement methodology. And um, finally, I will yeah, turn to the topical developments uh, for advance of future quantum Hall standards and explain the aspects, uh, potential and challenges of novel device architectures and material systems. To start with, what is metrology? A metrology is the science of measurement and the modern metrology roots in the French Revolution where it was decided that yeah, some units were based like uh, on, 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 on nature constants, like the length standard was based on the Earth's circumference. And it also introduced um, a metric system, decimal-based um, um, metric system, which was introduced in 1975, um, and, and some more, um, um, uh, let's say, novelties on, on measurement standards. Um, then there was um, the meter convention, the very high, the highest international, let's say, convention uh, as an international treaty to ensure measurement conformity between the countries, which was established in 1875, uh, so really something like 100 years later. Uh, initially, there were 17 members of member states, and now the meter convention has more than 16 members. And one of the organizations of the media convention is the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. Um, the abbreviation is BIPM, um, which is in several close to Paris, which is an intergovernmental organization that coordinates uh, international metrology and the development of the metric system. So in the early years of the media convention, um, yeah, things were rather primitive. Uh, uh, compared with modern times, and here you see some yeah some pictures from these old times. For instance, on the top right, you see the copy uh, of the international prototype of the meter. Uh, then on the in the bottom left side, you see the uh, let me just change this to a laser pointer. The international prototype of the kilogram. 
uh, and I come back to this later. And in those old times, also the second was uh, rather primitively defined uh, via, yeah, via the mean solar day, just by defining that the mean solar day is 86,400 seconds. And here you see a historical picture of the Pavillon de Breté um, uh, of the BIPM uh, in Sèvres. Um, the international um, uh, metric system of units, or the SI abbreviated, was founded in 1960. Um, and um, this came because the modern physics evolved. And um, so um, this was then decided in 1960 to establish this international system by uh, Conference Générale de Poids et Mesures, CGPM, uh, in that year. And uh, it gave rise to the definition of the seven base units shown here. Um, which you all may know, so meter, kilogram, second, ampere, Kelvin, mole, and candela. Uh, this slide so shows again um, what um, yeah um, the status uh, or, or some some details of the systems that were valid until April 2019. On the left hand side, you see again the base units, the seven base units that I just mentioned. Uh, and um, the unit definition, and on the on the right um, most right um, column, you see um, yeah the the realization means that were used um, for a long time. Already by that time, um, I want to point out that um, for the second and for the meter here for the two first entries, there were the uh, was a concept of defining or giving exact values to define the second and the meter. For instance, the second was uh, defined by the hyperfine transition of uh, cesium already, and the meter was this defined by the distance that light travels in a vacuum in a specific, a specific uh, interval of time. So via the second and an exact value for the speed of light in vacuum. Also interesting to note is here that uh, yeah, the kilogram of uh, the kilogram, so the, the unit of mass was defined by an international prototype of the kilogram, the so-called IPK, which you already saw on one of the previous slides. And uh, for us in electricity, uh, it's interesting to note that the ampere unit of electrical current uh, was defined via the force between uh, two wires that uh, each carry a current. Uh, the realization of the ampere um, for a long time was done indirectly via calculable um, uh, so sorry, via electromechanical um, voltage um, balance apparatus uh, in combination with a calculator uh, capacitor for the impedance. Um, then um, the physics evolved and uh, we got to what we call the quantum revolution in electrical metrology. Um, historically, it probably started uh, with a Josephson effect that was um, predicted or discovered, or let's say predicted by Brian D. Josephson in 1962 already. And you here see a simple portrait of uh, what the um, this effect is and what they use it for in metrology. So it is a fact, an effect that um, appears if you weakly couple two superconductors and irradiate them with a microwave, typically, so with, a, with, a, with photons or yeah, photon uh, photon field. Um, so these superconductors are typically um, separated by a tunnel barrier or by another weak link. And in doing so, um, you can realize something that we call a perfect frequency to voltage um, a converter, uh, which, uh, yeah, besides frequency and voltage and integer number n, uh, introduces this uh, ratio of two uh, constants of, of nature, which is Planck constant and the elementary charge here. Um, then, on the other hand, a little bit later, by Klaus von Klitzing in 1980, was discovered the quantum Hall effect, um, and I will later speak more in detail about this. And uh, yeah, what we do in metrology, we use this uh, this, this um, um, uh, relation here, which defines the uh, Hall resistance in terms of only another integer number, and, and again a ratio. Uh, H over E square, which again uh, just needs the Planck's constant and the elementary charge. And what we do in metrology is we use the uh, these resistance plateaus. So if you plot the whole resistance versus magnetic field, we use these resistance plateaus, which show this, yeah, these quantized values. As we use the um, the voltage plateaus, um, uh, as for instance, this example is shown to uh, get uh, defined well defined values for voltage. Uh, so voltage and resistance values can be derived from Josephson and quantum Hall effect very universally um, and um, um, with unparalleled reproducibility. 
And because this was so um, successful, it was decided in 1990 that um, the electrical standards um, for, or let's say the international representations for the Volt and the Ohm were based on standards that were uh, given by the quantum electrical um, effects, meaning by the quantum Hall effect and um, the um, um, and the Josephson effect, which is missing here in this slide, sorry. So in 1990s, it was decided to fix the values for the Josephson constants, which is 2e over h, which is the ratio that is appearing here, and the von Klitzing constants, which is e over e square, uh, to these uh, fixed values. And uh, since 1990, metrology was using uh, these relations with these two fixed uh, values to derive voltage and, um, and resistance. Um, uh, this is again shown here um, in the slide. So although the unit uh, of ampere, even uh, so since 1990 until April 2019, was um, given by um, the force between current carrying wires, uh, we had the, a representation of the ampere, an indirect representation, by using ohm and uh, um, volt values that were derived from the quantum um, a, a voltage and resistance standards based on the quantum Josephson and Hall effects. So you can say that uh, in this time from 1990 until uh, lately, so until uh, exactly April 2019, this um, SI system faced uh, two main problems uh, and uh, mainly two main problems, which are indicated here. The first problem was that the, um, uh, the um, uh, kilogram uh, was still defined via the mass of the international prototype of uh, the kilogram. So by an artifact, an artifact um, that was yeah, stored in, uh, in, uh, at the BIPM in, in Sèvres. And uh, where several copies have been made that were internationally distributed. And the second problem was that there was a discrepancy for the ampere between the unit definition of the ampere, as I said, and the realization, which was not a real realization, but more a representation via the quantum electrical effects. And um, Considering this, um, uh, together with all the, um, the improvements that uh, quantum metrology, uh, electrical quantum metrology in particular, had made, meanwhile, um, the um, 26 CGPM in Versailles in November 2018 decided to change uh, the, um, the um, SI, so to revise the SI, which was a quite paradigmatic change um, and, as I said, enabled by the achievements of the modern quantum physics. And it was said that the international system of units was revised in its historic vote, which is which was uh, on uh, so with a single with a single uh, with a single voice, without contradiction. Um, since then, since uh, 20th of May uh, 2019, when this revision uh, took effect, the um, uh, we still have the concept of base units. So you see the same seven base units here on the left side, but now all these um, units. Um, are defined via exact values for uh, certain constants of nature, which are given in this column by this um, um, by this by this yellow um, fields here. And uh, turning to uh, let's say now again this problematic uh, region here of kilogram mass, you see that the kilogram uh, is now defined via a um, fixed uh, value for the Planck constant, which is given here. So this uh, value has no uncertainty. And it is realized via even uh, Kibble balance, which is formally called Watt balance, which involves Josephson voltage and quantum Hall resistance standards or effect, or a silicon sphere with a well-known number of silicon atoms. And the ampere, um, uh, for the ampere, it is enough to define, in addition to H, the elementary charge or the exact value for the elementary charge, which you see here. Also, this has no uncertainty. And then this allows now to indirectly again define the ampere via the Josephson voltage and quantum Hall resistance standards or in a direct way by using single electron transfer, uh, which I will explain in a minute. But the main thing is here that, that since May, uh, 20th of May 2019, the whole SI system is based on these uh, fixed values for the constants of nature. So what does it mean now for the Josephson and the quantum Hall effects? Again, that means in the revised SI that is valid today and will yeah, be valid for a long time, uh, presumably, the Josephson and quantum Hall based electrical standards are primary standards in the SI, and they use the exact values of H and 
uh, and, and E for the realization of the Volt and the Ohm. Uh, they allow reproducibility and now also accuracy in the device SI at the part per billion level. And practically all electrical units are derived from the quantum hall and Josephson effects or traced to these effects, if you want so. So it means the by the revision of the SI, these two, um, yeah, the, the, the importance of these two effects were even more increased. Now, again, what about the ampere? Um, because we speak about quantum hall and Josephson, and how, how is the ampere now derived? And, um, the, the top panel shows it, and you all, it's quite trivial for you to understand this. You all know uh, that by Ohm's law, the, um, the electrical current is related to uh, electrical voltage and resistance uh, in this triangular form, as we said once so. Uh, and, and then again, the Josephson voltage standard or Josephson, Josephson um, AC Josephson effect um, makes this link to this um, Josephson constant and the quantum Hall effect is linked to the von Klitzing constant um, H over E square. So we simply derive in most practical, um, for most practical applications, the ampere from a combination of Josephson and uh, quantum Hall effect. Um, there is also the uh, yeah, uh, possibility for a direct re realization, which is so shown on the bottom panel. This is what I already said. Uh, in principle, it's possible now um, to use modern um, uh, single electron transport devices that an, enable a, a clocked transport of single electrons in, uh, in these circuits. Uh, these circuits are typically micro nano circuits. Um, and you see an example for such a circuit here on the right hand side. Um, this is an, an area, a serious area of uh, four so called uh, single electron pumps, which were fabricated and, and studied here at PDB, but also other NMIs and other research institutes um, are doing a research in this direction for uh, more than 20 years or so. Um, yeah, here the, 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 in the middle, you see how in principle such a single electron pump uh, works. So you have two, uh, you have an, uh, a one dimensional um, semiconducting channel. Um, and then you uh, create something like a dynamic quantum dots with a static and the dynamic gate, electrostatic gate. And then by modulating uh, one of these gates, you can uh, enable that a single electrons uh, enter the middle of this, or this quantum dot here in the middle, uh, one by one. And the precondition is that the, the dot is uh, small enough so that the capacitance is small enough to really to allow to um, yeah, control single electrons here. And then by lifting this potential again, you can throw out these electrons to the other side and then you get um, an effect uh, that you transfer one or N, in this case, N is two electrons uh, per transfer cycle. However, uh, I should say that these um, single electron transport standards are not at this really metrological standard level yet, uh, since the reproducibility or let's say accuracy, if you want so, is um, not yet at the, at the one part per billion level where we aim at, but it's about uh, 100 parts per billion. Uh, in practical, so that that really needs to do some or need, need some more improvements that needs to be done in the future to make this really yeah, usable, let's say, for primary quantum elect electrical metrology. Uh, I come to the second point of my talk now, uh, which is the uh, yeah, aspects of quantum resistance metrology based on the quantum Hall effects. Uh, just to introduce again, um, and most of you will know that, that the quantum Hall effect uh, was discovered by Klaus von Klitzing in 1980 during measurements um, in the uh, high, field, uh, high magnetic field laboratory in Grenoble on, when, he, when he studied silicon MOSFETs. And um, yeah, you see Klaus von Klitzing here in front of his apparatus by that time, and this is a picture showing the silicon MOSFETs that um, he was studying. And this is, uh, I think, a copy from his lab book where you see the, um, yeah, the, the, the whole resistance uh, measurement here. This is the whole resistance curve. And you see the uh, occurrence of these plateaus, uh, yeah, which he discovered, um, found it very interesting and, um, uh, and, and enabled him to make the relation uh, so that the, um, these um, values or the plateau values of this whole resistance are related to um, this constant h over e squared together with this i, which is an integer. And um, this is another copy from his lab book, which I would like to show here because it is a relation for us metrologists. In that very night when he just had discovered this, um, the uh, quantum Hall effect in Grenoble, um, he made the sketches to his lab book where he derived the main things already, as you can see here. 
Um, but there's also this in, in, in this um, box here, there is an interesting note. There's a telephone number given from PTB and the telephone number was the, uh, the number of the PTB vice president by the time. So it, it means that in, obviously immediately Klaus von Klitzing um, realized in that night that there was an interesting relationship uh, to metrology um, that might enable to have a new um, representation or realization of, um, of the ohm by this by the quantum hall effect and he called uh, Professor Kose to um, at PTB to discuss this with him. Uh, anyway, uh, then um, soon after that, so five years later, uh, Klaus von Klitzing was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics um, for the discovery of the quantized Hall effect. And here you see, yeah, okay, you see the photo of Klaus von Klitzing by that time. And here, this is the, on the right hand side is a more recent photo. You still here see see, see the the Nobel Prize medal, and he's uh, yeah. I think Klaus is still very proud of that. Uh, you also see the uh, screenshot here of um, of the paper that he um, that is the main paper for 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 the Nobel Prize award at that time, uh, where he's the first author, of course. And you see that the title of the paper was a new method for the high accuracy determination of the fine structure constant. There's a little story behind that because in, uh, the first version of this paper was submitted under a title that stressed the relation uh, for a new realization or the relation of the quantum hall effect for a new realization of the ohm. But um, this first submission was not successful, so it was rejected um, by the reviewers. And only after Klaus von Klitzing had changed the title of his paper to, and, and he had pointed out the relation to the fine structure constant, uh, then the paper was accepted and finally uh, became this very famous um, paper and gave rise to the um, to the uh, Nobel Prize award. Um, yeah, since then, um, also the quantum hall physics evolved a lot. Nowadays, um, we use the quantum hall effect um, for quantum resistance metrology, as I said, but we no more use the silicon MOSFETs. Um, we use uh, the standard, um, let's say, quantum hall systems made from gallium arsenide, aluminum gall gallium arsenide heterojunctions. And yeah, you see some, some, some pictures here on the left side, you're seeing this typical um, the band structure and you see here the, uh, yeah, the heterostructure, um, how, it's, how it's made from typically from NBE, so from mo molecular beam epitaxy, um, including modulation doping. And this uh, creates a two-dimensional electron gas with uh, high electron mobility at low temperature up to 10 million square centimeter per volt second. And uh, then typically we use uh, devices from this um, uh, heterostructures um, as shown in this photo. So you see two hall bars on the chip. Uh, so that the, the chip, um, the side dimension here should be something like one centimeter. So to, uh, to see two hall bars with a typical arrangement of electrodes, you have so six, uh, so three and three uh, potential contacts on each side of the hall bar plus then two um, source and drain uh, current contacts. And yeah, this is uh, bonded into this chip carrier and then used in our labs, uh, like in PTB and many other metrology labs in the world for state of the art um, quantum hall effect metrology. Um, and they're just, this shows again uh, how this then works. So you see the typical fingerprint of the quantum hall effect. That means here um, the, the upper curve is the hall or transverse resistance uh, measured uh, between orthogonal. Um, 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 potential contacts here on each side with these typical plateaus uh, in these, uh, in, indicating this, this, this um, integer numbers here. And you see it that at, uh, at the same time when, the, uh, when such a plateau value in the whole voltage appears, that the longitudinal resistance drops to zero. And this is exactly the fingerprint or smoking gun, if you want so, for the quantum hall effect. Uh, which is shown here in this in this blue box that yeah you have a uh, disappearing uh, longitudinal resistance and at the same time you get this quantized uh, values for the um, Hall resistance. If you want to learn more about the uh, uh, quantum Hall effect uh, uh, used as an electrical resistance standards, I just point to this very nice paper from our Swiss colleagues Pierre Dieckelmann and Blaise Jeanneret. Um, from the Swiss Metrology Institute but that was written uh, yeah, like 20 years ago, but which is still quite actual because it comprises the main aspects of uh, quantum hall effect resistance metrology. Um, 
I come now to a slide which shows the, uh, the, 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 the effect, the big impact that the quantum hall effect had in metrology. Uh, yeah, it's called the quantum hall boost in metrology, if you want so. So this measurement panel shows um, the results from international comparisons um, of, uh, quanta, uh, of not of quantum hall, but of resistor artifacts that were used before um, the discovery of the quantum hall effect. So over that time, um, precision resistors were used um, at each uh, or at the individual um, national metrology labs. Typically, these resistors were wire wound uh, resistors as they are still uh, sometimes used for uh, secondary standards. Nowadays, you see the symbols here, the different uh, colors indicate the measurement results, comparison results from um, different uh, national metrology institutes. You see here on the bottom, the PDB, the, the, blue, the blue square. Um, uh, this is the results from the PTB um, over many years from like from 60, what is it, 62 maybe uh, until the 80s. Uh, then if you see, for instance, the, the brown circles, this is the results from the so-called National Bureau of Standards, which was by that time the name for the National Metrology of USA. Nowadays it's called um, the NIST. And uh, what you see here is a big scatter um, in the uh, or rather a relatively big scatter in the in the in the results together with a drift uh, let's say prominent drift of many of these um, resistor um, values or uh, resistance values over over a couple of years so we can say that typically this artifact uh, resistance standards uh, drifted um, of the order of yeah uh, some parts in 10 to the 7 per year and of course, that was not bad. Okay, one ten to the uh, one part in ten to the seven is okay, but of course, it can be better. <clears throat> and um, then after the quantum hall effect was used um, as a reproduction for the um, for the ohm, um, um, also again these 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 comparisons, these international comparisons were um, uh, were continued or were repeated. And uh, you see an example of such a result here. This is an international comparison. Let's say the dates uh, are from 93 to 99. Uh, you see again different national metrology institutes, um, the, the Swiss, the, the, the German, um, the English and the, the USA Institute. And you see now that the scatter in this, um, um, in this results of the order of 10 to the minus nine. So that is a really big improvement and this exactly demonstrates, uh, demonstrates how big uh, the importance of the quantum hall effect for resistance metrology uh, is. Yeah, so this is what I already said. You could reproduce the resistance values uh, in your own lab, but also inter-site uh, in inter comparisons with this very, very um, excellent um, reproducibility of 10 to the minus nine. Um, I now come to um, yeah, explaining a bit uh, the concepts uh, of measurement techniques uh, for DC resistance and uh, the task um, that you will have as a, or that you want to face as a metrologist is uh, to measure a resistor as precisely as possible. And um, how do you do it? Well, in metrology, you do that if you compare your unknown resistor with a well-known resistor. This is the, yeah, the, the, the main, uh, the golden solution for it. Uh, if you want so. And the method uh, that you have uh, now are, are twofold. Either you can do it in a so-called potentiometric way, or you can do it uh, with bridge techniques. And um, I want to explain a bit more on these two um, methodologies in the following, on the following slides. So the um, potentiometric methods um, are, are indicated here. So we have a current source. Uh, which uh, which feeds uh, two resistors that are uh, here connected in series to the source uh, with the same current and then of course you get a voltage drop across um, these two resistors and you can use a potentiometer which is uh, which, which comprises a high impedance voltage detector and the voltage source here and so in the first step you would uh, yeah, connect your potentiometer to let's say the resistance number one and you would adjust a compensation a voltage uh, vp here in the way that you nearly completely compensate the, the drop, the voltage drop U1 here, and the, you would measure the remaining um, the voltage, which is very, very small or close to zero then with this uh, detector. And then in the next step, you would uh, just switch the, the potentiometer without, without changing anything um, to uh, the second resistor and measure the, the change, the change in this um, voltage different now. And uh, then you would do it again and again, just to get the type A uncertainty. So the statistical uncertainty low. And from this, you could derive your resistance value 
whatever uh, uh, of these two um, resistors is well known, let's say, um, okay, one, one should of course be a known resistor and the other one with the device on the test resistor. Uh, the problems and limitations of this potentiometric method or methods are shown here in this box. Um, so uh, let's say this all works very well if the two resistance values R1 and R2 are, are equal or very close to each other, but it becomes critical if one, uh, one resistance is much higher than the other one. And here I have assumed that R2 is much higher than R1. Because um, this potentiometric method where you feed both resistors with the same current will then lead to a much different joule heating in each resistor. For instance, if R2 uh, is, is bigger than R1, of course, then you will heat the, um, the, the resistor 2 um, uh, much more than R1 and you get might get problems with the current or, or temperature coefficient. Uh, also, the linearity of a potentiometer uh, comes into play if uh, yeah, one uh, of uh, one is much different from from U two, um, and of course, since you want to repeat the measurement many times, uh, the short term stability of your current source will play a certain role. So there is uh, room for improvement, and this is not the in, indeed not the best method. Uh, or the potentiometric method is not the preferable method that you want to do at the at the highest accuracies. Uh, which we usually aim at here in metrology institutes. So um, what is better is if you use a bridge method as um, indicated here in principle. A bridge me method um, uh, yeah, means that you have uh, the re two resistors, maybe one is the uh, unknown and the other one is the known one in, um, in two separate current circuits. So that means you feed an individual currents to each resistor. Here you have two current sources. And you, you have a, a short contact, and then you would measure the um, um, the uh, the voltage difference again with a with a detector. Uh, let's say best with a null detector, uh, if the both resistances are, are quite equal. And um, in order to do so, yeah, you must um, make um, the uh, ratio of the current that you apply. Uh, close to the inverse, of course, of the resistance ratio, because then you can measure this small bridge voltage. Uh, close to zero. And um, now the question that now comes is how, how can we manage to make the um, uh, ratio of the currents equal to the inverse resistance ratio as good as possible? In other words, um, how can we balance this bridge as uh, metrologists say? And um, an old method that is still uh, commonly used in room temperature bridges uh, resistance bridges is the so-called DC current comparator, which, which was invented by Custis in 1964. And you see the scheme here. So you have these two circuits with the two resistors and the two current sources. And then in each of these circuits, you have um, yeah, you have windings uh, or coils with a different number of windings. And here you can adjust the number of windings with the sliding uh, with a slider and these both windings, the fluxes from these are coupled um, to a high permeability magnetic core, which again, you can also AC modulate um, or wobble um, to, um, to get a different uh, system. And then you measure the, um, um, the, the difference in the flux by this zero flux detector, which has a servo feedback to one of the uh, current sources. So here, for example, to the current source number one. And then um, after you balance the bridge, um, you um, will get a zero flux. So that means uh, the zero flux detector measures the difference of the fluxes um, in uh, N1 and N2. The servo feedback makes the difference zero. And, and if you adjust then N2, so the number of windings for the slider, so that you get a zero um, a reading here on your uh, null detector, then you have um, achieved that the resistance ratios are um, inverse to the uh, number of, um, of turns in your two coils here. And uh, of course, also um, like uh, the uh, inverse of the uh, of the current. And by this, you can um, achieve um, um, ratio accuracies uh, within, let's say, 15 or 50 minutes or half an, half an hour of measurement time of few parts in the eights. Um, um, yeah, uh, if you do everything very well, this is already quite nice, but um, it still be, can be improved. And um, if you want to improve this method, you have to work on this way how to um, how to achieve a better nulling or how to null this this uh, this circuit or this bridge, how to balance this bridge. 
or in other words, how to achieve that n that is the flux difference um, is is really very close to zero. And in the modern bridges, which which are cryogenic bridges, as I will explain in the following, uh, you do this by um, yeah by making use of an effect that is provided by superconductivity. And before I come to this very point, um, I just see I have a question. Okay, the, sorry, I, I just see I have a question. Uh, could you provide a brief explanation of how the watt works? I think it's probably the watt balance. Um, since this is a bit out of the field, I, I would like to shift this uh, question to the end of my talk. Okay, I will come back to that. Thank you. Okay, uh, just let me continue on this. Um, so we involve an effect by superconductivity and um, uh, I make a little excursion how to explain the, the, the principle. Uh, it's uh, what we use is the Meissner Oxenfeld effect. Um, and imagine now you have a superconducting two tube, um, which is then, of course, an ideal dye magnet. Um, and let's assume that the length of this tube is much larger than the diameter. And then you have a wire uh, through this tube. Um, and then you switch on a current on the, in this wire. Um, then um, you will see, or of course, the effect will be uh, effect caused by superconductivity. Um, that this um, uh, that this current here induces a screening current, uh, a persistent screening current on the tube, so that the magnetic uh, field in the in the bulk of the tube material is zero, and the main point is now that the screening current and at the surface of your tube here is uh, the, the density of the screening current is uniform across the tube, uh, sur uh, tube outer surface, and in particular, um, it is independent of the geometrical position of the wire inside the tube. And that is the main thing. Um, and that means that uh, also the uh, magnetic field that um, your screening current now here causes, which is proportional, of course, to this current I1 in the tube, is independent of the position of the wire. And uh, now you can uh, go further and uh, put, for instance, two wires into the tube and uh, drive two counter uh, to, to, to uh, opposite currents through these two wires. And then you will, of course, achieve that the screening or that the magnetic field um, here outside of the tube, uh, which is proportional to the difference of the, 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 these two currents, is indep again independent of the positions of the wires. And that means you can uh, detect, uh, if you can detect this uh, magnetic field outside the tube, you have a means uh, to say or determine when these two currents inside in the wires in the tube are annihilating or yeah, canceling out each other. And this is all, as I said, independent of the geometry or of the position of the wires. And this is the main thing to understand. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, you you have uh, passed your time for the first talk. I don't know if you want to make a break uh, before continuing. Um, uh, I would like to make a the break a bit shorter or even skip it uh, because I think it might be a little long. I will try to to um, speed up if you are okay okay with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, whenever uh, people want to ask questions, probably they should uh, do it along uh, while you are talking. So the okay. I have, I, I have one question that I would like to um, answer after the talk. Is this okay? Perfect. No problem. <laughs> but please, please, please send me more. Okay. Uh, I will speed up a bit and, and go on. Um, so um, this gives rise to the invention of the cryogenic current comparator, which was um, first described by Harvey in 1972, which is uh, this, the perfect version of the DC current comparator. And um, uh, here is the scheme. You see again, like before with the DC current comparator, you have these two circuits. Uh, which now involve these two, um, two coils in each uh, circuit with a different number of windings. And uh, then you would uh, just uh, put this into a superconducting shield and equip it with a, a flux null detector, which we need, which is uh, then, uh, of course, a squid because everything uh, must be in the cold here to make the, the shield, which is typically of lead, become superconducting. So it's easy to also apply a squid for detecting uh, the magnetic flux outside of the shield. and. Um, yeah, if you then again uh, use this um, signal from the flux null detector uh, to drive a servo feedback to one of the current sources, um, you can uh, you can null the the flux uh, outside or inside the or outside the tube. Uh, here, as I said, 
uh, very nicely and much better than in the example before. You can do this um, with an uh, accuracy better than, in, in, in relative units, better than 10 to the minus 10. And then you can derive the um, value uh, of the ratio of the two resistances, that, which is then given by the ratio of the numbers of turns uh, of these two coils here, um, including the small, uh, let's say, uh, uh, remaining signal on your uh, null detector uh, of your nano voltmeter here. And this enables to measure resistance values with an accuracy of a few parts per billion. Uh, here you see some pictures that show, so show such a cryogenic com comparator um, uh, as fabricated by PDB. Uh, you see here the, the, the principle again, you have this the superconducting shield or screen. This is typically, as I said, from lead. Then you have the two calls within two, two uh, different um, number of turns. For, for example, here, the blue coil has one turn, the red coil has two uh, turns, and the shield is also fabricated or manufactured in a special way. It's not just like here, uh, open at the both ends, but it's more like um, a snake swallowing its own tail just to um, make the tube very long and at the same time avoid edge, uh, edge effects. Uh, you see the example of such a lead uh, shield here. Uh, it's not, not finished yet. You still can see the captain fall that is making the insulation between two of these uh, of, of these neighboring layers of lead here. And then the wires are, are brought out from this uh, apparatus, from this comp current comparator here uh, through this long chimney that is ending somewhere here on top of the, of the picture. And then you see um, another crucial part, as I said, this is the DC uh, squid that we use as a null detector um, in the CCC uh, together with a pickup loop here. And then the and we can imagine that you will put your coils, uh, your current comparator with the coils and the lead shield into this um, uh, holder here and the chimney goes through this hole. Okay, this is um, the, uh, in short words, the, uh, um, the apparatus that we use. We have a uh, PDB uh, developed um, uh, uh, in-house here, which is meanwhile commercialized. You see a picture of the commercialized system here. So this uh, co comparator with the coils and the superconducting screen is here. You will immerse this in a liquid helium dewar in operation. And then you have an electronics that is mainly these two um, current um, sources together with a null detector. Uh, with a voltage uh, nanovoltmeter, sorry, and of course the squid uh, null detector is also here inside the comparator. Uh, this has proven to be a very um, compact, fast, and robust apparatus. And yeah, you, as I said, you can buy it, and this meanwhile quite uh, successful and uh, used at um, many um, national metrologies, not only at PTB. Um, if you then further want to perform um, quantum Hall effect metrology. Um, you might want to have something like a guideline uh, that tells you how you can um, how you can do your measurements. Uh, what is this, uh, what is the best practice to do these kind of measurements? And there's also papers that you can use for that. Uh, so there's this paper that is, was first published in 1989 and updated in 2003 by uh, colleagues from yeah, from France and from from. Um, uh, from Switzerland, uh, Francois Delahaye and Beat Jekyllman. And yeah, they give advice how, yeah, yeah, how your device geometry should be, how you should handle your device, uh, what uh, yeah, the contract properties should be. Uh, they speak about the conditions for quantization and other, uh, and other conditions that you must meet in order to do proper quantum Hall effect uh, metrology. Uh, from this, um, uh, quantum Hall effect apparatus uh, together with the quantum Hall effect uh, device. So then at NMIS, we typically build the uh, DC resistance scale in the fashion that is shown here. So we start at the quantum Hall resistance value. Typically, we, we take the I equal to two plateau, uh, so 12.9 kilo ohm. And then we apply our cryogenic current comparator and transfer this value um, uh, to 100 ohm or 10 kilo ohm, typically um, uh, reference standards. Um, uh, and from, from these two reference standards, that typically use a PDB. We use then other, can, can use other ratio, uh, ratios like 10 to 1, 100 to 1 to transfer these values, these decadic values to, um, yeah, to do um, the values of the working standard resistors. And you can see we cover a quite uh, large range of resistance from, let's say, typically like 1 ohm up to 1 mega ohm or even more. Um, and this uh, slide shows the traceability chain and the calibration hierarchy that we uh, have general for all units. But here is, of course, uh, the example for the resistance uh, metrology. 
Uh, so we start at uh, typically in each country, it's like that or similar. We, we start at a national methodology level, which is the PDB for Germany, which keeps the primary standards, so the quantum hall standards, which then uh, calibrates the um, uh, calibration labs that are accredited by an accreditation organization. Uh, which uh, typically uh, the countries have. From there, they are distributed to in-plant calibration labs, uh, typically yeah, in, in, in companies and bigger companies. Here you see some examples. And from then, yeah, to, to the various um, measurement instruments and equipment that are used um, throughout the labs or, or fabs. Uh, and of course, um, you, uh, yeah, if you go down from the level of the National Metrology Institutes to the real, let's say, uh, user instruments, yes, on the one hand, you have on the one hand the um, um, calibration uncertainty that is increasing because you lose uh, um, accuracy in each of these calibration steps. On the other hand, of course, you have a huge, uh, due to the multiplication um, effect here, you have a huge number of uh, calibrations that you do here at the bottom level. Um, I can come to this slide and then uh, before I make a short break and, and start with the last uh, part of my talk, which uh, just shows how the specific role of PTB in Germany is as the National Metrology Institute. So yeah, we are under the auspicious of the Federal Ministry um, for Economic Affairs and Energy in Germany. Uh, PDB does research development in all fields uh, or relevant fields of metrology. Uh, we also do um, the aspects or work on the aspects of legal metrology. For instance, we give traceability to calibration authorities. Uh, we um, uh, we, may, we, we um, support politics uh, regarding metrology aspects, for instance, uh, ministries uh, give support and standardization and uh, also do a lot uh, of cooperations in technical and, and industry. Uh, for instance, by technology transfer. PDB has, and these are numbers from 2020, about 1,450 uh, permanent staff members, uh, plus 600 non-permanent. Uh, we have an annual expenditure of about 250 million euro. And uh, yeah, that's the main numbers for PDB. Uh, you see the structural organization um, of PDB. We have um, Below the presidential board, of course, we have uh, the um, the scientific or metrology um, depart, um, divisions here. Uh, we have uh, an, an nine uh, metrology divisions um, plus uh, two um, yeah administrational divisions. You see that um, yeah the divisions names are typically like a physics textbooks. So you have mechanics and acoustics, electricity, and so on optics. Uh, our department, quantum electrical metrology, is uh, located in the division of electricity, uh, which has in total six departments and about uh, 150 uh, staff members. I'm now finished with this part of my talk. Uh, I could use now a break to answer questions or could just continue or we just make a real break. Uh, I asked Sergio what, what, is, what is best. Uh, this is, uh, we are a little late, uh, yeah. so we, we should have a, a short break. Uh, it depends on if you if you want to take a break yourself uh, or just um, answer the questions at this moment. I think that it will be. Uh, since, you, since we are late, I would say uh, I can continue. Just take a sip from my bottle. And I see two, two, two questions. Two questions, so you... Mm -hmm. Uh, could you explain a bit more about how to build the resistance scale from? Um, I don't know now how this is meant. Um, maybe the person it was anonymous who asked these questions could tell me what he meant. Uh, I think this relates to this to this um, uh, to this slide. Um, as I said, we start from the quantum Hall effect. Uh, and then we use the cryogenic current comparator to um, calibrate our reference standards here at PTB. And from these, um, the, uh, the, 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 the practical uh, working standards are, are, are calibrated. Um, this is a principle, the way how we do it. Um, maybe you, the, 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 to the person who asked, who asked this question, maybe you can make it a bit more concrete. And then I could come back to it uh, after the talk, else I don't know. Uh, what else to explain here. And I would just continue. Somehow it doesn't work. Okay, sorry, let me go back. So um, there is uh, another question. Ah, it uh, just popped up, yes. 
how do you take care of the lead resistance during the calibration process? Uh, yeah, so the quantum, <laughs> the, the, we do four, uh, four terminal measurements. I come back to that in a minute. And uh, simply by, by four terminal measurements, the quantum Hall effect um, measurement is also a four terminal measurement. I hope this, this answers the question. Uh, okay, I would like to continue now. So as I've shown you for the DC, um, uh, we can use the um, DC quantum Hall effect for the ohm unit realization with parts per billion accuracy and for a worldwide harmonized um, uh, DC resistance scale that is disseminated. We can also use it for the purpose of um, uh, the, the, the AC regime. We can also use the quantum Hall effect for the realization of an impedance uh, of, of impedance and capacitance units, typically in the kilohertz range uh, with few parts per billion accuracy. Some more. Um, the the backside is that uh, we can only we only have a few discrete values uh, from the, given by the quantum Hall effect, like the one I, I equal one or I equal two plateau. This this means we need this uh, measurement bridges, as I just explained, to build the resistance scale over many decades. And usually, uh, you're operating quantum Hall devices uh, based on the uh, gallium arsenide uh, heterostructures require uh, quite large field like 10 Tesla and quite low temperatures like one Kelvin, which means uh, quite an uh, effort, um, which is only costly, also costly, of course. So not everybody can operate um, these uh, devices of the quantum Hall effect, uh, for instance, in a, in, a, in a calibration lab in industry. Um, how can we overcome this backside? So the first one, uh, these few discrete values, we can use new device architectures. And the second one, um, we can, <coughs> excuse me, um, we can, uh, we, we hope that we can use new materials for the quantum Hall effect in the future. And I will speak now about these aspects. So I will speak about um, uh, potential challenges uh, of novel device architectures and material systems. Uh, the first topic I want to address is the so-called quantum hall array resistance standard. So arrays from quantum hall effect devices, and then also um, new concepts for contact and wiring. And then in the second part of this subpart, I will speak about non-novel material candidates, uh, candidates uh, which, uh, which are the two-dimensional Dirac cone systems like uh, graphene topological insulators or also 2D metallic organic and covalent organic frameworks. Um, the first um, thing is to say a few words about this quantum hall area resistance standards. You see an example here. This is a one mega ohm uh, quantum hall eff effect um, uh, array based on uh, gallium arsenides comprising 88 gallium arsenide um, hall bars, which are serially, uh, sorry, of which are 75 serially connected uh, together with a subset that is in part parallelly connected. And uh, if you do this correctly, <coughs> Sorry again. You see that you can um, achieve. Uh, you can. Uh, this can yield in a, um, a resistance value that is very close um, to um, one mega ohm. Uh, this is the device that was fabricated and investigated by our colleagues in uh, Korea. And uh, there's another example showing such a similar architecture, but only with ten quantum Hall effect elements uh, from graphene, which uh, was used to uh, fabricate a 129 kilo ohm. Um, array um, uh, in, in this example uh, also at um, at CRIS, also the Korean National Metrology Institute. Uh, the purpose of these arrays are to provide the decadic values that um, yeah decadic values, for instance, like this one mega ohm array, and values that can be uh, yeah significantly higher than RK. It can shorten the calibration chains. It can enable uh, yeah building a quantum Hall effect based Wheatstone bridges. It may allow higher excitation currents. For instance, if you lose, uh, use parallel arrays, uh, you can diminish the self-heating. And you can also reduce the measurement of time, of course, if you can use uh, larger currents. Um, however, this uh, the drawback of these arrays is, as, as you can easily see from such a picture, that you easily accumulate contact and wiring resistances. And this is now a, uh, an aspect already related to the question I just got. Um, well, if you make serious uh, connections of quantum Hall arrays, then of course you you have a, a two point serious connections in yeah, but typically or trivially, and you have to deal or you have to care about your your connecting uh, and wiring resistance, 
and this needs advanced uh, methods uh, to overcome this. And um, there, there, uh, to do this, there is the concept of um, multiple terminal connections uh, for um, serial connections, for instance, of quantum hole devices. Uh, this was developed in, uh, yeah, first mentioned in uh, 1987, and then further developed in 1993 by Francois de la Haye. It uses network theory um, on the DC equivalent circuits of quantum Hall effect devices. And it shows uh, that if you use redundant links, uh, con connections between multiple terminals of quantum Hall devices, you can reduce the level of contact and wiring resistances um, in, the over in, the, in the resistance of the overall device may be serious or parallel connections. Uh, I want to go a bit uh, more into the detail. So uh, first of all, this is a, yeah, a, a trivial quantum Hall effect measurements showing the, the, the quantum Hall bar here uh, with a source and drain um, connect, uh, connections to terminals. Uh, we, and you drive a current, of course, in this direction. Then the uh, wiring is uh, attributed with a uh, wiring resistance R, which here in this example is meant also to already include the contact resistance here. So uh, this small R is uh, wiring plus contact resistance. And um, if you do it well, um, as I already said, you would do a four terminal measurements. That means you would measure the quantum hall, um, the voltage uh, here between uh, the low, the high and the low potential side of the hall bar. So orthogonally um, to, the, to the flow of current. Now, if you want to uh, uh, do a two terminal com a measurement on this, this means if you do not do the measurement between low and high potential, but between the source and drain contacts themselves, you can do that because yeah, as the potential lines show that uh, the whole voltage appears also between these two contacts, source and drain. But of course, you would, um, in addition to the whole resistance, get uh, two times your um, wiring's resistance if both. Uh, wiring resistance here in both sides are equal, of course. Um, but now it was shown by Francois Delahaye with his network theory that if you take uh, multiple connections to um, yeah, terminals here on each side of the hall bar, like uh, shown here, then um, the, um, the, yeah, the difference between the hall voltage, so the quantized voltage, and the two terminal source drain voltage that you can measure here, um, it can, it becomes uh, becomes equal because the uh, yeah the, the the influence of the um, wiring and contact resistance diminishes um, with this number with this ratio epsilon so epsilon is the ratio of the wiring and the quantum hall uh, resistance and it diminishes with the power of n when n is the number of contacts now that means if you increase the number of terminals that are contacted. Um, you can manage to get this two terminal resistance very close uh, to the four terminal resistance. And it just depends on the number of contacts that you made on each side, how, how good you can do this. And this was all, already also shown, of course, uh, mid of 90s by colleagues of NIST that is in fact, uh, it, it is like that. So they measured exactly uh, whole bars like that and then they vary the um, number of contacts they used and they can they could show that they could approach the um, quantum hall, the quantized quantum hall value um, uh, up to a few parts and 10 to the nine. You know? uh, for instance, this uh, that was used here is a famous uh, uh, so triple terminal connection. So you use uh, three uh, contacts on each side uh, to diminish the contact resistance. So th three were enough. Uh, three contacts to get already um, to the uh, uh, very close to the uh, quantum Hall effect um, uh, from Klitzing resistance uh, with a deviation that is was of the order of um, uh, one part in, in a billion. Um, yeah, uh, you can use this multiple, multiple terminal connections, uh, for instance, for serial connections of quantum Hall effect elements uh, in these areas, as I said. And if you even want to do it much better or even better, uh, then you can further reduce the wiring resistance by using super superconducting materials. And this is a very late um, result uh, that was achieved here in the work from PDB together with NIST. This was an example for um, yeah, low wiring resistance on a graphene-based quantum Hall device. Um, it uses, on, on the one hand, it uses this split gate, uh, sorry, this, this uh, split contact design, yeah, for, for a, if you want so, a, a, a micro um, a representation of this multiple, uh, uh, multiple terminal connection uh, together with um, superconducting material. So in this uh, example, niobium titanium nitride uh, for, the, for the contacts, just as, just as, a, as an example. Um, 
yeah, then there is a lot of potential now for quantum hall based uh, resistance metrology in new um, uh, uh, material systems. Systems that are, of course, based on two dimensional uh, Dirac cone materials. And as I said, I want to shortly go through um, the graphene based uh, systems, uh, the topological insulators, all those systems which show the quantum anomalous Hall effect, and then a rather new family of materials as the last point. Um, for graphene, I, I, this is just an introductory slide. I think I can, uh, I do not need to say much about this uh, graphene, this monolayer of graphite uh, is a Kepler semiconductor, uh, to, uh, which provides a two-dimensional electron system with massless uh, relativistic fermions. So Dirac particles, of course, there was the Nobel Prize also awarded for this uh, discovery to uh, Andre Gaiman, Konstantin Novozilov, um, and um, yeah, um, the graphene is very interesting uh, and has also its uh, peculiarities uh, regarding the quantum Hall effect, uh, because it has a particular band structure and Landau level quantization. Uh, the, the bottom, uh, so, sorry, the top box shows the quantization, which we already saw, so 1 over i times uh, the von Klitzing constant, which you find in, let's say, conventional 2D materials, uh, which show this integer quantum Hall effect. Um, and in topological terms, you can identify these materials by yeah, having a Berry phase of zero. Then you will see that in these materials and the conventional ones, the spacing between the lumbar levels is proportional to um, the magnetic field. While in a graphene, in the monolayers, you have a topological Berry phase of pi and you find the so-called half integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, just uh, represented by this formula, which just shows that you get a different behavior um, uh, a principle in generally different behavior of the quantum Hall effect. And also you find in particular that the spacing between the Landau levels and graphene is proportional to the square root of B. And all this gives rise to the fact that uh, you can um, observe um, the um, quantum Hall effect in graphene at lower magnetic fields or um, uh, respectively at larger temperatures, which is shown here in, um, in, in this view graph. Um, so, um, a 15 Tesla, typically you have a spacing between the n equals zero and one Landau levels uh, difference by a factor of about five in graphene and gallium arsenide. So graphene is, of course, five times higher than in gallium arsenide. And um, this view graph shows, uh, let's say, the operating space where you can operate your quantum hall based either graphene or gallium arsenide devices. Um, and you see here for here, for instance, this point in the in the, in the green part, which shows the, the, the proper operating space so that you can, for instance, use um, graphene devices at 4.2K, uh, typically um, at about five uh, uh, Tesla of magnetic field. While yeah, here um, with gallium arsenide, you might, might reach this um, border um, at a temperature of 1.4K already at a field of, of 10 uh, Tesla. So. Um, the next slide just in principle shows the same, um, ex except that there is a third parameter given in this view graph, it's just the um, uh, operating current through the device. And of course, again, you see that the operating parameter space um, for quantum Hall effect quantization in graphene is much bigger than in gallium arsenide. These are literature values or derived from literature values and refer to quantum Hall effect operation at the part per billion accuracy level. Well, if you have all this now, um, uh, if you have your apparatus like the, the, the cry, uh, cryogenic current comparator bridge and the graphene device, um, uh, you might want to operate your uh, system, your quantum Hall effect uh, resistance system um, in a commercial or sorry, in, the, in a compact cryo cooler, which allows you to, um, to have uh, to, to use a, a, a closed um, a helium um, um, a circuit uh, so you, that you do not need to operate with uh, helium cans that need to be refilled um, uh, many, uh, at, at ex external suppliers and which is costly and so. And in order to do so, you have to yeah, conform with the uh, requirements that come from this cryo cooler, which is typically that they provide temperatures about 4K and can uh, have uh, magnet systems inside that typically deliver up to five Tesla. And this shows that you can you can do a quantum Hall effect resistance methodology with graphene, uh, but uh, not all graphene devices that you might find um, uh, will work. So you need a special, yeah, specially tuned and optimized 
uh, graphene devices. And um, uh, at PDB and, and other institutes, we were uh, we did a lot of um, investigations and research and optimization in this direction lately in the last years. Um, for a long time, the long-term stability and the adjustment of the uh, charge carrier density were an issue. Um, it was overcome after at Chalmers University, um, a method um, was um, invented how to, yeah, uh, how to um, properly dope uh, graphene uh, in a way that it, uh, that it ensures um, a long-term stable um, carrier density values. Um, as I said, it was from Chalmers University. Here you saw, you see the, the screenshots of the, of the original papers. Um, I will not go into the details here, but um, well, uh, here you see how you do it. You have your graphene on a silicon carbide. So this is all for a particular graphene that is grown from silicon carbide. And then you have a resist layer, and then you have a dopant blend here in certain layers of this resist with a special chemical uh, compound, um, which is, well, I will not read the name, which we abbreviate F4TCNQ, which is then embedded in this PMMA uh, resist. And by doing this properly, you can yeah, ensure that your device is, um, has a <clears throat> well-tuned uh, carrier density and is stable too. And uh, these are just a few results, late results, for, latest results from, from PTB. So it, indeed, we, uh, we, we managed now to get uh, high quality epitectural graphene monolayers grown on silicon carbide um, that were um, doped and um, uh, by this F4TCNQ molecular doping method and uh, which uh, provides carrier densities NOP here you see sufficiently low for quantum Hall effect at small car uh, at small fields so typically this uh, carrier densities should be of the order of 10 to the 11 per square centimeter or lower and here you see some measurement results uh, for instance here um, high accuracy measurement result um, with a performed with a, a cryogenic current comparator that shows that the um, hall voltage, the deviation from the from Klitzing constant here, the, um, is uh, less than uh, one part per billion um, in the magnetic field range between uh, yeah four and, and and nine Tesla, and this is a result that we uh, got at four point two Kelvin. So this is already very well useful for uh, graphene-based uh, quantum hall resistance metallurgy. The second candidate, of course, are now the topological insulator materials showing the quantum anomalous Hall effect. And since time is maybe short, and most of you are much better experts in topo uh, topology, uh, topological metaphysics than me, I do not need to introduce a lot on this. Uh, just sh showing this maybe famous um, view graph from a, from, a, uh, from a paper that is cited here. Uh, which is showing the, uh, the, the, the family of uh, quantum Hall effects. Uh, so the quantum Hall effect discovered by Klaus von Klitzing, spin Hall effect uh, discovered in 2007. And then the quantum anomalous Hall effect is uh, from 2013. I uh, find this always a nice picture. And I just want to uh, say that um, only two of these effects are relevant to my knowledge, at least in electrical quantum metrology, which is, of course, the quantum Hall effect discovered by Klaus von Blitzing and then the quantum anomalous Hall effect, which we are beginning to explore for, yeah, for quantum uh, resistance metrology. Um, uh, the quantum spin Hall effect, I think, has no real relevance uh, in quantum electrical metrology yet. Okay, there was also the um, uh, Nobel Prize in physics, of course, for the discovery of um, uh, uh, the theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological uh, phases of matter. And uh, yeah, together with this nice uh, press release from the Royal Swedish Academy of Science uh, called Strange Phenomena in Matter's Flatlands, which try to elucidate how yeah, the, the, let's say, uh, space um, uh, topological aspects um, might be um, related to this really complicated and for me sometimes esoteric uh, part of physics. Anyway, um, as I said, you all know much more about these systems that we are currently investigating. And uh, for us metallurgists, on particular at PTB, uh, we lately did investigations on this um, bismuth um, antimony telluride um, system that is then magnetically doped with magnetic um, ions, uh, either vanadium or chromium. And then uh, finally gives, um, as uh, in the previous talk by Michael was explained in detail, 
um, gives the uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect uh, by uh, by this uh, chiral edge stage that are spin spin polarized around the perimeter of of, of such a sample. Um, we get these devices, uh, these samples from the uh, from uh, University of Würzburg, from the a group of um, Lawrence Molenkamp, uh, working together with Charles Gold from that group. Uh, for us as metrologists, it is interesting that um, yeah that these these systems provide this dissipationless um, and topology protected um, edge states, uh, which then show the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Which means they they show the uh, the Hall effect at uh, b equals zero, so without external magnetic field, uh, as you can see in this in this example here from from a measurement. So it means uh, that uh, these systems provide a Hall resistance um, equal to R k, whenever uh, and if um, uh, again the longitudinal resistance in these uh, devices uh, disappears. Um, to comprise the main things already here, uh, the effect. Now, um, to my knowledge, was only observed at millikelvin temperatures and up to a few nanoamps of current. Um, there is some prospect that this might um, be uh, lifted to higher temperatures and higher currents in the future, and there are also indications. But for us as metallurgists, uh, the main point is that the quantum Hall effect is still accurate, uh, let's say within a part uh, per billion. Um, uh, so um, yeah, this is what what we what we aim at, uh, and um, in co collaboration with the University of Würzburg, we were able at PTB to do a uh, universality test of the quantum anomalous Hall effect by performing a precision me measurement of the Hall voltage um, in an investigation uh, done in 2017, and then uh, the results published in 2018. Here are these two publications that are indicated. And the result that we got was that we could show that the quantum anomalous Hall effect is uh, quantized in terms of RK <clears throat> within an uncertainty margin of a quarter of a part per billion, um, which is which is a record result uh, because the lowest reported uncertainty before um, was uh, of the order of 10 to the minus four in relative measurement uncertainty. Um, as I already said, um, the uh, challenges are given by the temperatures and the currents that are needed to um, uh, to get these results. We had to operate, or uh, we operated uh, the device uh, down to um, currents of a few nanoamps. Uh, of course, we need to get the devices up to uh, carrying uh, tens of microamps. Uh, typically, this is gallium arsenide, we operated 40 microamps. And of course, also, we want to get rid of the millikelvin operating temperatures because we want to operate the system at a few Kelvin, which then again would allow to, yeah, to operate it in a, in a cryocooler, in a cost-effective cryocooler system together with a small magnet. And this brings me already to the benefits that such a potential quantum horn anomalous Hall effect based uh, system would uh, provide. Of course, it would uh, provide a possible operation without liquid helium cooled uh, high field magnet. Uh, could be operated hopefully in a dry cryocooler with a closed um, helium uh, uh, circle. And um, yeah, so in effect could um, uh, could um, lead to compact cost efficient quantum based resistance metrology on the workshop floor, maybe in a, even in industrial um, uh, environment. And uh, as the last point, very important, <clears throat> since uh, the quantum anomalous Hall effect does not need uh, um, um, external magnetic field, you could operate it in combination uh, with the Josephson based quantum Hall, uh, sorry, quantum voltage standard. In a single in the same cryo cooler, as I said here, and if this becomes reality, which is something like a vision of us, uh, we would have something like a quantum metrology toolbox, um, yeah, for 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 many purposes of practical uh, quantum electrical metrology. Uh, we do these investigations uh, as um, the uh, the frame of, of of this conference also shows in the uh, Torture project, uh, together with uh, a lot of coll collaborators. Um, uh, as you see here from the list of um, of, 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 um, of from a consortium list, PTB is um, a national metrology institute. That there are there are not not many other more. The others are not more. VTT also incorporates a metrology institute. But you see, um, yeah, we are uh, we are we are representing more or less metrology in this project, and we hope for yeah getting results towards the directions that I just um, uh, 
uh, that are just uh, flashed. Um, the objectives of Tocha include, of course, um, the points that are already uh, just explained. Uh, to use the quantum anomalous Hall effect at higher operating temperatures and currents as presently possible uh, for developing quantum resistance standards based on the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, and that's uh, what I wanted to say about the topological insulator so far. I think I have still something like 15 minutes. No, I'm, I'm, I think I've, I'm over with my time, Sergio. Um, I would have a last point, which I could make very short. Sorry for being too long. Is that okay? Uh, so yeah, you have a more five minutes and then questions. Uh... Okay, okay. I will, I will hurry through this. The, the last point is uh, very recent developments uh, in the, um, yeah, by discovering 2D metal organic or covalent organic frameworks, um, uh, which uh, came to interest lately. Uh, and here, the uh, maybe one of the first or the two first um, uh, publications in 2013, uh, there was a theoretical prediction of a new family of organic topological insulators. And uh, as in, in all these typical systems, uh, there are two essential components. First, you need, you need a lattice symmetry. Uh, provided by a hexagonal lattice, for instance, like graphene. And the second, you need uh, spin orbit coupling, for instance, uh, by incorporating atoms with uh, strong spin orbit coupling, like uh, heavy metal atoms, as was pointed out in the talks before already. And um, this is given by, um, yeah, by, by, by a scheme uh, or by a material like this, which is a proposed uh, synthesis process for this triphenyl metal molecules that then form 2D organometallic super lattices. Um, and here you see uh, very schematically how such a super lattice and let's uh, in the end an of hexagonal uh, shape um, uh, is, is, is made. This is also from this, um, uh, from this, national, uh, from this um, uh, publication from 2013, um, uh, which is a th also theoretical um, uh, work. Uh, here you see the calculated band structure with spin orbit coupling and um, yeah, the Dirac cone um, here, the gap um, around the Dirac point, about um, 8.6 milli uh, electron volt. Um, uh, then um, there were further predictions uh, that from the same year that the quantum anomalous Hall effect could be discovered or sorry, could be uh, realized in these systems. Uh, where, for instance, the um, magnetization was provided uh, by manganese atoms, like in this example here. And then uh, a few days later, there was uh, even more evolved concepts, like you could use such uh, 2D metal organic systems uh, yeah, for, for cone tronics, as it was said. Um, and so, so rather, um, uh, rather interesting prospects for this kind of um, uh, new materials. Of course, there was already, meanwhile, um, demonstrated that you could uh, synthesize such materials. Uh, for, here's an example <clears throat> uh, uh, from 2020, so quite recent, uh, of such an organic system with a Kagome lattice, uh, which, has a, which is a Dirac, point, a Dirac cone system. And um, um, yeah, the, these, these um, systems are, of course, interesting for us metrologists because they may, is, is hoped, uh, provide unique features and considerable potential as they might provide a certain chemical and structural and uh, not uh, last but not least electronic uh, tolerability. And they give rise for spintronics, valetronics, as they call it, contronics. And even then the applications could be uh, hopefully at room temperature. And this is now a citation from this paper as the energy differences between the Dirac cones are larger than 100 milli electron volts. Uh, this is a prediction. Um, we have to see if all this works out. Um, and I just wanted to mention, and this is now really at the very end, um, that PTB is already um, um, also involved in a, a European joint research project that has just started 1st of June uh, with the title Two Dimensional Lattices from Covalent and Metallic Organic uh, Frameworks for the Quantum Hall uh, Resistance Standards. Uh, duration is uh, three years. Here you see the consortium, and here you see now that um, uh, not only um, one or two uh, metallurgy institutes are in this consortium, but it's six. So here you see this uh, this project is even more focused on uh, metallurgical aspects than Tocha. Uh, I will skip the details of what we want to do in this project. Um, of course, uh, we start with the synthesis 
uh, of uh, of the materials and in the end what would, would like to end up with something like yeah that we could evaluate regarding potential for quantum anomalous hall uh, sorry quantum hall effect um, based resistance methodology um and this is also um, part of the objectives to perform quantum hall effect measurements on the manufactured devices uh, to assess the potential of the materials for this for such standards of course uh, now I'm really at the end. Um, I see the, the target flags here. I want to shortly summarize. I hope I could show you that uh, quantum-based resistance and impedance methodology is a mature discipline uh, which has benefited greatly since uh, the 1990s from the exploitation of quantum hall resistance standards made from gallium arsenide heterostructures. Then I mentioned that a quantum resistance metrology based on graphene is possible. And, and in fact, it is evolving with standard devices becoming usable and used in a growing number of metrology institutes worldwide. And um, novel uh, material systems, so-called the Dirac cone systems, including the, of course, topological insulators, hold considerable prospects for further advanced uh, resistance, quantum resistance and impedance metrology and they are presently explored in um, joint European research projects. And now I'm at the end uh, and I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg, uh, Hans Jörg, for this very, very instructive uh, lecture. Uh, so we have a couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, uh, yes. The first one is one that was led from before. I think it was what? Uh, Could you provide a brief, brief explanation of how the what what balance works? I assume this was a question. Um, yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, um, slides now to show it. Um, the principle is in print, uh, a weighing apparatus, so a balance, indeed a balance, a mechanical balance. Uh, on the one side of the balance, you have a mass, which you want to measure. And on the other side of the balance, you have a coil. And um, uh, you could drive a current through this coil. And then by an external magnetic field, you can balance, you can balance the, this, this weighing apparatus. So in fact, you can electromagnetically uh, measure the, um, uh, the mass of your object. Or in other words, you have a realization or representation of the kilogram. And since if you write the equations down, uh, in, the, in principle, in this balance, compare electrical and mechanical power, it is called power or watt balance. Uh, this is in, in a nutshell how this how this apparatus works. Yeah? And if you write down the equations, um, um, uh, and then for the electrical side, you include the electric, uh, electrical quantum standards of uh, quantum Hall effect and Josephson effect, which you will both need uh, to measure your electrical power. So if, if, if you if you calculate everything out, that you, you will see that um, from the from Klitzing and from the um, uh, um, uh, from uh, from the Josephson constants that the elementary charge drops out from this equation, and then that there's just the Planck the Planck constant stays. Yeah. And this shows then that, that you can directly connect the kilogram uh, to the value of the Planck constant. Okay. I hope I, and I assume that this this all this answers somehow the question. And I refer to uh, you know, to textbooks on actual quantum metrology. It's explained. It, it's a very famous uh, apparatus, and it's, it's explained in many uh, papers. There is a second question I see. Could you use three five materials with smaller electron mass to get larger Landau levels Landau level gaps instead of gallium arsenide, like indium antimonide, and get better temperature performances? How does this compare to graphene? Well, okay, I cannot give a think. Uh, cannot give a very thorough uh, answer or a very deep answer to that question. Um, there may be alternative systems, but the most prominent in the in the past years, um, because it obviously has the uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah the best promises for for future applications is is um, uh, is, is graphene, yeah, and uh, and the others uh, I I'm sorry uh, they are not really sort of like indium antimonide based system they are not really present in metrology. Uh, but I cannot tell you the, the the deep physical details why not uh, yeah. So really, the most prominent, of course, is the gallium arsenide. Then it's followed by by the graphene. Meanwhile, 
And um, uh, then there is a lot of hope in this um, um, quantum anomalous Hall effect systems. And so I'm sorry, I, I cannot give more, say, I cannot say more to that. I have a sort of a related uh, question. Uh, to, to which extent uh, is graphene uh, being used uh, in metrology centers and mm. uh, let's say replacing uh, the gallium arsenide uh, two dimensional electron gases? Mm. Um, to which extent is it is it uh, used in metrology institutes? Um, it is um, uh, fabricated in, in not many metrology institutes. So let's start with the fabrication. There are few metrology institutes that can fabric fabricate graphene. Uh, one of the very few that can do that is, is PDB. We can fabricate it in our clean room center. We, we do um, epitaxial um, uh, graphene uh, grown on, on silicon carbide. Um, meanwhile, there are companies uh, like, for instance, in Sweden, um, probably also elsewhere, uh, that uh, that provide commercial graphene, which you then can buy uh, in a structured fashion or can structure it yourself in your clean room if you have this uh, facility uh, for uh, quantum for getting quantum hall bars. Um, about the use of uh, graphene-based standards at NMIs, they, they are still few. Uh, I think the, the vast majority of, um, of quantum hall standards is still gallium arsenide based, but there are a few that are uh, using um, graphene samples uh, for first calibration, let's say purposes, uh, and also at PDB we do that meanwhile, but it's, it's, it's rather fresh. I would say, um, despite the fact that graphene um, for, for metrology is studied for 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 quite some years now, about 10, I would say, um, it is not so that uh, it's meanwhile a breakthrough and that uh, let's say like half of the or, or a considerable fraction of the NMIs would use um, um, graphene based quantum hall resistance standards. It's not like that yet. And one of the reasons is the stability, as I mentioned. Thank you. Uh, you have another question. Uh, yeah, it's from Mariella Mengini. You showed uncertainty in quantum anomalous Hall effect of 10 to the minus six. Is this related to the physical effect somehow? And is there a rule of thumb how, how to increase the temperature if uh, to improve this uncertainty? Uh, I'm smiling because yeah, exactly. Th th these are open questions. I mean, uh, to our basic understanding, and I should here refer better to the basic or to the understanding that the colleagues in Würzburg who fabricate the samples have uh, the performance and also the the, the critical temperatures and and uh, related the critical uh, currents are related to the stability of the magnetic state and the hope is that by uh, better understanding the magnetic state and to make it more by making it more stable uh, we will be able to increase both temperature and current that is a short answer to a question that I think nobody can really, uh, really in detail answer presently because there are so many open, uh, open questions. Yeah. Uh, there is not, there is not a real rule of thumb. Uh, uh, the only thing that comes to my mind is trivial. Whenever you will have a system, most probably whenever you will have a system um, that um, can carry a larger critical current or that has a larger critical current you will also find that the, that the operating temperature can be uh, increased. Uh, these, are, oh, these are usually interrelated, of course. I have a, a question regarding uh, this, uh, the, the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So the, the, the precision is 10 to the minus six. Uh, this is already quite good, although several orders of magnitude worse than, than other, other uh, materials, uh, the two-dimensional two electron gases. Uh, however, you don't need magnetic field. Uh, can uh, and then you can combine it, for example, with uh, with the Josephson effect and and so on. So, is there any in any situation in which, even though this precision is not so high, uh, the the quantum anomalous Hall effect in this system can become useful anyways that you can apply it uh, in some situation? Um, okay, we have to compare then this this quantum system to the let's say non-quantum to conventional systems. And if, if you um, speak about the precision of 10 to the minus, let's say now 10 to the minus six or one PPM, um, you will find that you uh, have conventional resistor, let's say uh, secondary resistor standards that have um, um, uh, sufficient stability to compete with this, with this quantum systems. Okay. Or in other words, you can, e you can use a very um, 
a simple uh, and small like box like 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 10 times 10 times 10 centimeter um, a, a, a standard resistor which you can buy uh, that you once calibrate which has a good stability once thermalized or, or, or thermostated yeah, this is and basically the situation pre pre quantum quantum hall effect that you have a 10 to the minus 7 precision right uh, exactly you, with conventional yeah. means you can can get 10 to the minus 7 yeah yeah that's and true. if you really want to go to the parts per billion level where the state of the art level is, uh, you, need to, you need to get much, much, much better. Yeah. So this 10 to the minus six definitely uh, for the quantum anomalous Hall effect is nothing where you can presently really think about a, um, a breakthrough invention or something like that. So basically, you at least need to go to 10 to the minus eight. To see, uh, yeah, I would say yes. So if you can, yes, if you get better than 10 to the minus seven, it becomes interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are almost on time, uh, but is there any other question? Uh, I have a technical question about uh, one, one, something that you mentioned in some slide. And I mean, that you have uh, precision in single electron transport uh, that goes to 100 per uh, 100 billions, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Part per billion, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Part per billion. Uh, uh, is this what, what limits this, and uh, uh, how precise can you can you go? Yeah, you know? exactly. So um, this question uh, uh, related to the single electron pumps and their accuracy. Um, um, it is uh, that um, answered by um, the um, single electron transport effect is a stochastical effect in a certain sense. And you will find that in all of these systems, you get stochastical errors in the transport. That means uh, in the picture that I showed, you will not always manage to, um, to, cap to, to capture exactly one electron or two, which you want, one or two, you must decide, uh, in your, in your um, dynamic quantum dot. But sometimes one electron is missing or there's in other times, there is uh, another one coming in addition. Yeah? So you cannot perfectly control that. And these uh, statistical errors, um, they deteriorate um, uh, the, uh, the device uh, precision. And what you must do uh, to overcome that in practical is you must measure these, these errors. And you can measure these errors, but this uh, includes um, uh, this then again. OK, maybe I jump back. Uh, incorporates. I want to jump back. I cannot. Uh, this this needs incorporating. Ah, here we are. Uh, here in, in this circuit that we were studying, we have four pumps in series. Uh, already uh, to put several pumps in series makes the uh, statistical errors uh, smaller. Uh, and in order to measure the errors, the single electron errors, uh, we incorporate single electron detectors, which is a single electron trans transistor. The uh, on chip with a device between the uh, each two of each uh, two of these pumps, you have this single electron detector capacitively connected, and it can sense if you have an excess or a missing electron of su on such an island for a longer time. That means you get a very complicated circuit already when you want to operate this, which provided an accuracy. Uh, maybe of, of um, uh, not of this level, but comparable. So you you need to uh, operate and control a very complex uh, circuitry. And um, uh, the, 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 the solution would be really uh, to detect all the single electron transport errors and, and um, compensate that yeah, or, or contribute or attribute that. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we don't have uh, any more questions, but we are just on time. Uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Hans Jörg, for uh, this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, mm, so we have uh, time for seven minutes break, and then we continue with the last uh, tutorial. Uh, see you later.